The Fables of Aesop, Selected, Told Anew, and Their History Traced, by Joseph Jacobs, Done Into Pictures, by Richard Highway, London, Macmillan and Company, and New York, 1894, all rights reserved to Prof. F. J. Child of Harvard. Contents. Preface. A short history of the Aesopic fable. The cock and the pearl the wolf, and the lamb the dog, and the shadow the lions share the wolf, and the crane the man, and the serpent the town mouse, and the country mouse the fox, and the crow the sick lion the ass, and the lapdog the lion, and the mouse the swallow, and the other birds the frogs desiring a king the mountains and labor the hares, and the frogs the wolf, and the kid the wolf, the bat, the birds, and the beasts the heart, and the hunter the serpent, and the file the man, and the wood the dog, and the wolf the belly, and the members the heart, in the ox stall the fox, and the grapes the horse, hunter, and stag the peacock, and Juno the fox, and the lion the lion, and the statue the ant, and the grasshopper the tree, and the reed the fox, and the cat the wolf, in sheep's clothing the dog, in the manger the man, and the wooden god the fisher, the shepherd's boy, the young thief, and his mother the man, and his two wives the nurse, and the wolf the tortoise, and the birds the two crabs, the ant, the cock, and the dog the wind, and the son Hercules, and the wagoner the man the boy, and the donkey the miser, and his gold the fox, and the mosquitoes the fox without a tail, the one-eyed doe belling, the cat the hare, and the tortoise the old man, and death the hare, with many friends the lion, in love the bundle of sticks the lion, the fox, and the beasts the ass's brains, the eagle, and the arrow the milkmaid, and her pail the cat maiden the horse, and the ass the trumpeter taken prisoner the buffoon, and the countryman the old woman, and the wine jar the fox, and the goat preface. It is difficult to say what are and what are not the fables of Aesop. Almost all the fables that have appeared in the Western world have been sheltered at one time or another under the shadow of that name. I could at any rate enumerate at least seven hundred which have appeared in English in various books entitled Aesop's Fables. Strand's collection alone contains over five hundred. In the struggle for existence among all these a certain number stand out as being the most effective and the most familiar. I have attempted to bring most of these into the following pages. There is no fixed text even for the nucleus collection contained in this book. Isop himself is so shadowy a figure that we might almost be forgiven if we held. With regard to him, the heresy of Mistress Elizabeth Prigg. What we call his fables can in most cases be traced back to the fables of other people, notably of Truss and Babrius. It is usual to regard the Greek prose collections, passing under the name of Isop, as having greater claims to the eponymous title. But modern research has shown that these are but medieval prosings of Babrius's verse. I have therefore felt at liberty to retell the fables in such a way as would interest children, and have adopted from the various versions that which seemed most suitable in each case, telling the fable anew in my own way. Much has been learnt during the present century about the history of the various apologues that walk abroad under the name of Isip, published by Mr. Nutt in his Bibliotheca de Carabas. I have placed in front of the present version of the fables, by kind permission of Mr. Nutt, the short abstract of my researches in which I there summed up the results of that volume. I must accompany it, here as there, by a warning to the reader that for a large proportion of the results thus reached I am myself responsible. But I am happy to say that many of them have been accepted by the experts in America, France, and Germany, who have done me the honor to consider my researches. Here, in England, there does not seem to be much interest in this class of work, and English scholars, for the most part are content to remain in ignorance of the methods and results of literary history. I have attached to the fables in the obscurity of small print at the end a series of notes, summing up what is known as to the provenance of each fable. Here, again, 
I have tried to put in shorter and more readable form the results of my researches in the volume to which I have already referred. For more detailed information I must refer to the 40 closely printed pages vol. I. 225, 268, which contain the bibliography of the fables. Joseph Jacobs. A Short History of the Aesopic Fable. Most nations develop the beast tale as part of their folklore. Some go further and apply it to satiric purposes. And a few nations afford isolated examples of the shaping of the beast tale to teach some moral truth by means of the fable properly so called. But only two peoples independently made this a general practice. Both in Greece and in India we find in the earliest literature such casual and frequent mention of fables as seems to imply a body of folk fables current among the people. And in both countries special circumstances raised the fable from folklore into literature. In Greece, during the epoch of the tyrants, when free speech was dangerous, the fable was largely used for political purposes. The inventor of this application or the most prominent user of it was one Isip, a slave at Samos whose name has ever since been connected with the fable. All that we know about him is contained in a few lines of Herodotus, that he flourished 550. V. C. was killed in accordance with a Delphian oracle, and that Regild was claimed for him by the grandson of his master, Iadmin. When free speech was established in the Greek democracies, the custom of using fables in harangues was continued and encouraged by the rhetoricians, while the mirth-producing qualities of the fable caused it to be regarded as fit subject of after-dinner conversation along with other jests of a broader kind Miletian. Cyberitic, this habit of regarding the fable as a form of the jest intensified the tendency to connect it with a well-known name, as in the case of our Joe Miller. About 300. V. C. Demetrius Fuller Hughes, Willem Tyrant of Athens and founder of the Alexandria Library, collected together all the fables he could find under the title of Assemblies of Aesopic Tales. This collection, running probably to some 200 fables, after being interpolated and edited by the Alexandrian grammarians, was turned into neat Latin iambics by Fruz a Greek freedman of Augustus in the early years of the Christian era, as the modern Isip is mainly derived from Fruz. The answer to the question, who wrote Isip? Demetrius of Fullerin, G. Yotham's Fable, Judges X, and that of Menenius Agrippa in Livy, seem to be quite independent of either Greek or Indian influence. But one fable does not make fable, only about twenty fables however, are known in Greece before Fras. 30 A. D. C. My Caxton's Isop Vol. I. 2629. For a complete enumeration, for this statement, and what follows a reference to the pedigree of the fables on p. 196 will be found useful. In India the great ethical reformer, Sakimani, the Buddha, initiated or adopted from the Brahmins the habit of using the beast tail for moral purposes, or, in other words, transformed it into the fable proper. A collection of these seems to have existed previously and independently, in which the fables were associated with the name of a mythical sage, Kasipa. These were appropriated by the early Buddhists by the simple expedient of making Kasipa the immediately preceding incarnation of the Buddha. A number of his ishtas or tales were included in the sacred Buddhistic work containing the jtikas or previous births of the Buddha, in some of which the bodhisattva or future Buddha appears as one of the dramatis person of the fables. The crane, e. g. in our wolf and crane being one of the incarnations of the Buddha. So, too, the lamb of our wolf and lamb was once Buddha. It was therefore easy for him so the Buddhists thought to remember and tell these fables as incidents of his former careers. It is obvious that the whole idea of a fable as an anecdote about a man masquerading in the form of a beast could most easily arise and gain currency where the theory of transmigration was vividly credited. The Fables of Kasipa, 
or rather the moral verses Gathas, which served as a memoria technica to them, were probably carried over to Ceylon in 241. The C along with the Jtukas, about 300 years later, say 50 A. D. Some 100 of these were brought by a singles embassy to Alexandria, where they were translated under the title of Libyan fables, which had been earlier applied to similar stories that had percolated to Hellas from India. They were attributed to Kabais. This collection seems to have introduced the habit of summing up the teaching of a fable in the moral, corresponding to the Gatha of the Jtukas. About the end of the first century of D. The Libyan fables of Kaibais became known to the rabbinic school at Jen, founded by R. Jokinen ben Seke, and a number of the fables translated into Aramaic, which are still extant in the Talmud and Midrash. In the Roman world, the two collections of Demetrius and Kaibais were brought together by Nicostratus, a rhetor attached to the court of Marcus Aurelius. In the earlier part of the next century, C. 230. A. Uh, D. This corpus of the ancient fable, Aesopic and Libyan, amounting in all to some 300 members, was done into Greek verse with Latin accentuation choliambics by Valerius Babrius, tutor to the young son of Alexander Severus. Still later, towards the end of the 4th century, 42 of these, mainly of the Libyan section, were translated into Latin verse by one avian, with whom the ancient history of the fable ends. In the Middle Ages it was naturally the Latin phrase that represented the Aesopic fable to the learned world, but phrase in a fuller form than has descended to us in verse. A selection of some eighty fables was turned into indifferent prose in the ninth century, probably at the schools of Charles the Great. This was attributed to a fictitious Romulus. Another prose collection by Ademer of Chubinis was made before 1030, and still preserves some of the lines of the lost fables of Fruz. The fables became especially popular among the Normans. A number of them occur on the Bayeux Tapestry, and in the 12th century England, the head of the Angevin Empire, became the home of the fable, all the important adaptations and versions of Isip being made in this country. One of these done into Latin verse by Walter the Englishman became the standard Isip of medieval Christendom. The same history applies in large measure to the fables of Avian, which were done into prose, transferred back into Latin verse, and sent forth through Europe from England. Meanwhile, Babrius had been suffering the same fate as Fruz. His schisons were turned into poor Greek prose, and selections of them pass to this day as the original fables of Isip. Some fifty of these were selected, and with the addition of a dozen oriental fables, were attributed to an imaginary Persian sage. Syntipas. This collection was translated into Syriac, and thence into Arabic, where they passed under the name of the legendary Lachman, probably a Daubelt of Balaam. A still larger collection of the Greek prose versions got into Arabic, where it was enriched by some sixty fables from the Arabic Bidpe and other sources, but still passed under the name of Isip. This collection, containing 164 fables, was brought to England after the Third Crusade of Richard I, and translated into Latin by an Englishman named Alfred. With the aid of an Oxford Jew named Baruchia Hanacton Benedictus Le Puncteur in the English records, who, on his own account, translated a number of the fables into Hebrew rhymed prose, under the Talmudic title Michel Shulim Fox Fables, part of Alfred's Isip was translated into English alliterative verse, and this again was translated about 1200 into French by Marie de France who attributed the new fables to King Alfred. After her, no important addition was made to the medieval Isip. I have given specimens of his fables in my Jews of Angevin, England. 165, 173, 270, I, 281, 
with the invention of printing the european book of isop was compiled about one thousand four hundred and eighty by heinrich steinhauel who put together the romulus with selections from avian some of the greek prose versions of babrius from renusio's translation and a few from alfred's isop to these he added the legendary life of isop and a selection of somewhat loose tales from petrus alfancy and pagio braxellini corresponding to the Maletian and Sybaritic tales which were associated with the fable in antiquity. Steinhauel translated all this into German, and within twenty years his collection had been turned into French, English by Caxton, in 1484. Italian, Dutch, and Spanish. Additions were made to it by Brandt and Waldus in Germany, by Lestrange in England and by La Fontaine in France. These were chiefly from the larger Greek collections published after Stainwell's day, and, in the case of La Fontaine, from Bidpay and other Oriental sources. But these editions have rarely taken hold, and the Isop of modern Europe is in large measure Stainwell's. Even to the present day, the first three quarters of the present collection are Stainhowell mainly in Stainwell's order, Selections from it passed into spelling and reading books, and made the fables part of modern European folklore. An episode in the history of the modern Isop deserves record, if only to illustrate the law that Isop always begins his career as a political weapon in a new home. When a selection of the fables were translated into Chinese in 1840, they became favorite reading with the officials, till a high dignitary said, Morris, Kant, Rev. Sigzix, p. 731. We may conclude this history of Isop with a similar account of the progress of Aesopic investigation. First came collection. The Greek Isop was brought together by Nevelitus in 1610, the Latin by Nylant in 1709. The main truth about the former was laid down by the master hand of Bentley during a skirmish in the Battle of the Books. The equally great critic Lessing began to unravel the many knotty points connected with the medieval Latin Isop. His investigations have been carried on and completed by three Frenchmen in the present century, Robert, Du Maril, and Hervieux, while three Germans, Crucius, Benfi, and Maul, have thrown much needed light on Babrius, on the Oriental Isop, and on Murray de France. Lastly, I have myself brought together these various lines of inquiry, and by adding a few threads of my own, have been able to weave them all for the first time into a consistent pattern. The Fables of Isop, as first printed by William Caxton in 1484, now again edited and induced by Joseph Jacobs, London, 1889. Two vols, the first containing a history of the Aesopic fable. So much for the past of the fable. Has it a future as a mode of literary expression? Scarcely. Its method is at once too simple and too roundabout. Too roundabout. For the truths we have to tell we prefer to speak out directly and not by way of allegory and the truths the fable has to teach are too simple to correspond to the facts of our complex civilization. Its rude graffiti of human nature cannot reproduce the subtle gradations of modern life. But as we all pass through in our lives the various stages of ancestral culture, there comes a time when these rough sketches of life have their appeal to us as they had for our forefathers. The allegory gives us a pleasing and not too strenuous stimulation of the intellectual powers. The lesson is not too complicated for childlike minds. Indeed, in their grotesque grace, in their quaint humor, in their trust in the simpler virtues, in their insight into the cruder vices, in their innocence of the fact of sex, Aesop's fables are as little children. They are as little children and for that reason they will forever find a home in the heaven of little children's souls. Aesop's fables The Cock and the Pearl a Cock was once strutting up and down the farmyard among the hens, 
when suddenly he espied something shinning amid the straw. Ho, ho! What did it turn out to be but a pearl that by some chance had been lost in the yard? To mend that prize you, but for me I would rather have a single barley corn than a peck of pearls. The wolf and the lamb once, upon a time a wolf was lapping at a spring on a hillside, when, looking up, what should he see but a lamb just beginning to drink a little lower down? If only I can find some excuse to seize it. How dare you muddle the water from which I am drinking, nay, master? If the water be muddy up there, I cannot be the cause of it, for it runs down from you to me well then. Why did you call me bad names this time last year? That cannot be. I am only six months old. I don't care. Ate her all up, but before she died she gasped out any excuse will serve a tyrant. The dog and the shadow it happened that a dog had got a piece of meat and was carrying it home in his mouth. Now on his way home he had to cross a plank lying across a running brook. As he crossed, he looked down and saw his own shadow reflected in the water beneath, thinking it was another dog with another piece of meat. He made up his mind to have that also. So he made a snap at the shadow in the water. But as he opened his mouth, the piece of meat fell out, dropped into the water, and was never seen more. Beware lest you lose the substance by grasping at the shadow. The lion's share the lion went once a hunting along with the fox, the jackal, and the wolf. They hunted and they hunted till at last they surprised a stag and soon took its life. Then came the question how the spoil should be divided. Quarter me this stag. So the other animals skinned it and cut it into four parts. Then the lion took his stand in front of the carcass and pronounced judgment. The first quarter is for me in my capacity as king of beasts. The second is mine as arbiter. Another share comes to me for my part in the chase. And as for the fourth quarter, well, as for that, I should like to see which of you will dare to lay a paw upon it. But he spoke in a low growl, you may share the labors of the great, but you will not share the spoil. The wolf and the crane, a wolf had been gorging on an animal he had killed, when suddenly a small bone in the meat stuck in his throat, and he could not swallow it. He soon felt terrible pain in his throat and ran up and down groaning and groaning and seeking for something to relieve the pain. He tried to induce every one he met to remove the bone. I would give anything, if you would take it out, and told the wolf to lie on his side and open his jaws as wide as he could. Then the crane put its long neck down the wolf's throat, and with its beak loosened the bone, till at last it got it out. Will you kindly give me the reward you promised? The wolf grinned and showed his teeth and said, Be content. You have put your head inside a wolf's mouth and taken it out again in safety. The man and the serpent account Tremens, son by accident, trod upon a serpent's tail, which turned and bit him so that he died. The father in a rage got his axe, and pursuing the serpent, cut off part of its tail. So the serpent in revenge began stinging several of the farmer's cattle, and caused him severe loss. Well, the farmer thought it best to make it up with the serpent, and brought food and honey to the mouth of its lair, and said to it, Let's forget and forgive, perhaps you were right to punish my son, and take vengeance on my cattle, but surely I was right in trying to revenge him. Now that we are both satisfied, why should not we be friends again? No, no. Take away your gifts. You can never forget the death of your son, but not forgotten. The town mouse and the country mouse now, you must know that a town mouse once, upon a time, went on a visit to his cousin in the country. He was rough and ready, this cousin, but he loved his town friend and made him heartily welcome. Beans and bacon, cheese and bread were all he had to offer, but he offered them freely. The town mouse rather turned up his long nose at this country fair, and said, Cousin, how you can put up with such poor food as this? But, of course, you cannot expect anything better in the country. Come you with me, and I will show you how to live. 
When you have been in town a week, you will wonder how you could ever have stood a country life. The two mice set off for the town and arrived at the town mouse residence late at night. You will want some refreshment after our long journey, and took his friend into the grand dining room. There they found the remains of a fine feast, and soon the two mice were eating up jellies and cakes, and all that was nice. Suddenly they heard growling and barking. What is that? It is only the dogs of the house. Only. They do not like that music at my dinner. In came two huge mastiffs, and the two mice had to scamper down and run off. Goodbye, cousin. What, going so soon? Yes. Better beans and bacon in peace than cakes and ale in fear. That's for me as I am a fox. And he walked up to the foot of the tree. Good day, Mistress Crow. How well you are looking today, how glossy your feathers, how bright your eye. I feel sure your voice must surpass that of other birds, just as your figure does. Let me hear but one song from you that I may greet you as the queen of birds. But the moment she opened her mouth, the piece of cheese fell to the ground, only to be snapped up by Master Fox. That was all I wanted. In exchange for your cheese, I will give you a piece of advice for the future. His victim, both of wit. The sick lion, a lion, had come to the end of his days and lay sick unto death at the mouth of his cave, gasping for breath. The animals, his subjects, came round him and drew nearer as he grew more and more helpless. When they saw him on the point of death, they thought to themselves. Then a bull gored him with his horns. Still the lion lay helpless before them. So the ass, feeling quite safe from danger, came up, and turning his tail to the lion kicked up his heels into his face. Only cowards insult dying majesty. The ass and the lapdog, a farmer one day came to the stables to see to his beasts of burden. Among them was his favorite ass, that was always well fed and often carried his master. With the farmer came his lapdog, who danced about and licked his hand, and frisked about as happy as could be. The farmer felt in his pocket, gave the lapdog some dainty food, and sat down while he gave his orders to his servants. The lapdog jumped into his master's lap, and lay there blinking while the farmer stroked his ears. The ass, seeing this, broke loose from his halter and commenced prancing about in imitation of the lapdog. The farmer could not hold his sides with laughter. So the ass went up to him, and putting his feet upon the farmer's shoulder attempted to climb into his lap. The farmer's servants rushed up with sticks and pitchforks and soon taught the ass that clumsy jesting is no joke. The lion and the mouse once, when a lion was asleep a little mouse, began running up and down upon him. This soon waked the lion, who placed his huge paw upon him, and opened his big jaws to swallow him. Pardon, O king, forgive me this time, I shall never forget it, who knows but what I may be able to do you a turn some of these days, that he lifted up his paw and let him go. Some time after the lion was caught in a trap, and the hunters who desired to carry him alive to the king, tied him to a tree while they went in search of a wagon to carry him on. Just then the little mouse happened to pass by, and seeing the sad plight in which the lion was, went up to him and soon gnawed away the ropes that bound the king of the beasts. Was I not right? Little friends may prove great friends. The swallow and the other birds it happened, that a countryman was sowing some hemp seeds in a field where a swallow, and some other birds were hopping about picking up their food. Beware of that man. Why, what is he doing? That is hemp seed he is sowing. Be careful to pick up every one of the seeds, and by and by the hemp grew up, and was made into cord, and of the cord's nets were made. And many a bird that had despised the swallow's advice was caught in nets made out of that very hemp. What did I tell you? Destroy the seed of evil or it will grow up to your ruin. The frogs desiring a king, the frogs, were living as happy as could be in a marshy swamp that just suited them. They went splashing about caring for nobody and nobody troubling with them. 
but some of them thought that this was not right, that they should have a king and a proper constitution. So they determined to send up a petition to Jove to give them what they wanted, and threw down into the swamp a huge log, which came down splashing into the swamp. The frogs were frightened out of their lives by the commotion made in their midst, and all rushed to the bank to look at the horrible monster. But after a time, seeing that it did not move, one or two of the boldest of them ventured out towards the log, and even dared to touch it. Still it did not move. Then the greatest hero of the frogs jumped upon the log and commenced dancing up and down upon it. Thereupon all the frogs came and did the same. And for some time, the frogs went about their business every day without taking the slightest notice of their new king log lying in their midst. But this did not suit them. So they sent another petition to Jove and said to him, We want a real king. So he sent among them a big stork that soon set to work gobbling them all up. Then the frogs repented when too late. Better no rule than cruel rule. The mountains in labor one day, the countrymen noticed that the mountains were in labor. Smoke came out of their summits. The earth was quaking at their feet. Trees were crashing, and huge rocks were tumbling. They felt sure that something horrible was going to happen. They all gathered together in one place to see what terrible thing this could be. They waited and they waited, but nothing came. At last, there was a still more violent earthquake, and a huge gap appeared in the side of the mountains. They all fell down upon their knees and waited. At last, and at last, a teeny, tiny mouse poked its little head and bristles out of the gap, and ever after they used to say, they did not know where to go. As soon as they saw a single animal approach them, off they used to run. One day, they saw a troop of wild horses stampeding about, and in quite a panic all the hares scuttled off to a lake hard by, determined to drown themselves rather than live in such a continual state of fear. But just as they got near the bank of the lake, a troop of frogs, frightened in their turn by the approach of the hares, scuttled off and jumped into the water. It truly, and looking down saw a wolf passing under him. Immediately he began to revile and attack his enemy. Murderer and thief, what do you hear near honest folks' houses? Curse away, my young friend. It is easy to be brave from a safe distance. When he came closer he saw it was a serpent, to all appearance dead. But he took it up and put it in his bosom to warm while he hurried home. As soon as he got indoors, he put the serpent down on the hearth before the fire. The children watched it, and saw it slowly come to life again. Then one of them stooped down to stroke it. But the serpent raised its head, and put out its fangs, and was about to sting the child to death. So the woodman seized his axe, and with one stroke cut the serpent in two. Ah! A fly came up, and kept buzzing about his bald pate and stinging him from time to time. The man aimed a blow at his little enemy. But whack his palm came on his head instead. Again the fly tormented him. But this time the man was wiser and said, The fox and the stork at one time the fox and the stork were on visiting terms and seemed very good friends. So the fox invited the stork to dinner, and for a joke put nothing before her but some soup in a very shallow dish. This the fox could easily lap up, but the stork could only wet the end of her long bill in it, and left the meal as hungry as when she began. I am sorry. The soup is not to your liking, pray do not apologize, and come and dine with me soon. But when they were seated at table all that was for their dinner was contained in a very long neck jar with a narrow mouth, in which the fox could not insert his snout. So all he could manage to do was to lick the outside of the jar. I will not apologize for the dinner. Suddenly he observed a face glaring down on him and began to be very frightened. But looking more closely, he found it was only a mask such as actors use to put over their face. Ah, 
you look very fine. The jay and the peacock a jay venturing into a yard where peacocks used to walk, found there a number of feathers which had fallen from the peacocks when they were melting. He tied them all to his tail and strutted down towards the peacocks. When he came near them they soon discovered the cheat, and striding up to him pecked at him and plucked away his borrowed plumes. So the jay could do no better than go back to the other jays, who had watched his behavior from a distance. But they were equally annoyed with him, and told him, It is not only fine feathers that make fine birds the frog and the ox, O oh father. I have seen such a terrible monster. It was as big as a mountain with horns on its head and a long tail. That was only Farmer White's ox. It isn't so big either. He may be a little bit taller than I, but I could easily make myself and blew himself out, and blew himself out. Was he as big as that? Much bigger than that. Again the old one blew himself out, and asked the young one if the ox was as big as that. Bigger, father, bigger. So the frog took a deep breath, and blew and blew and blew, and swelled and swelled and swelled. And then he said, I'm sure the ox is not as big as this, but at this moment he burst self-conceit may lead to self-destruction. Andricles, a slave named Andricles, once escaped from his master and fled to the forest. As he was wandering about there he came upon a lion lying down moaning and groaning. At first he turned to flee, but finding that the lion did not, but he said, some beasts who were passing underneath him looked up and said, But he said, I am a bird, and no battle took place. So the bat came to the birds and wished to join in the rejoicings. But they all turned against him, and he had to fly away. He then went to the beasts, but soon had to beat a retreat, or else they would have torn him to pieces. Ah, I see now. He that is neither one thing nor the other has no friends. Ah, where can you see such noble horns as these, with such antlers? I wish I had legs more worthy to bear such a noble crown. It is a pity they are so slim and slight. Away bounded the heart, and soon, by the aid of his nimble legs, was nearly out of sight of the hunter, but not noticing where he was going. He passed under some trees with branches growing low down in which his antlers were caught, so that the hunter had time to come up. Alas, alas! We often despise what is most useful to us. As he glided over the floor he felt his skin pricked by a file lying there. In a rage he turned round upon it and tried to dart his fangs into it. But he could do no harm to heavy iron, and had soon to give over his wrath. It is useless attacking the insensible. The man and the wood a man came into a wood one day with an axe in his hand, and begged all the trees to give him a small branch which he wanted for a particular purpose. The trees were good-natured and gave him one of their branches. What did the man do but fix it into the axe head, and soon set to work cutting down tree after tree? Then the trees saw how foolish they had been in giving their enemy the means of destroying themselves. The dog and the wolf a gaunt wolf was almost dead with hunger when he happened to meet a house dog who was passing by. Ah, cousin, I knew how it would be your irregular life will soon be the ruin of you. Why do you not work steadily as I do? I would have no objection. I will easily arrange that for you. Come with me to my master and you shall share my work. On the way there the wolf noticed that the hair on a certain part of the dog's neck was very much worn away. So he asked him how that had come about. Oh, it is nothing. That is only the place where the collar is put on at night to keep me chained up. It chafes a bit, but one soon gets used to it. Is that all? Then good-bye to you, Master Dog. The belly and the members one fine day it occurred to the members of the body that they were doing all the work and the belly was having all the food. So they held a meeting and after a long discussion decided to strike work till the belly consented to take its proper share of the work. So for a day or two the hands refused to take the food, the mouth refused to receive it, 
and the teeth had no work to do. But after a day or two the members began to find that they themselves were not in a very active condition. The hands could hardly move, and the mouth was all parched and dry, while the legs were unable to support the rest. So thus they found that even the belly in its dull, quiet way was doing necessary work for the body, and that all must work together or the body will go to pieces. The heart in the ox stall a heart hotly pursued by the hounds fled for refuge into an ox stall, and buried itself in a truss of hay, leaving nothing to be seen but the tips of his horns. Soon after the hunters came up and asked if any one had seen the heart, the stable boys, who had been resting after their dinner, looked round, but could see nothing, and the hunters went away. Shortly afterwards the master came in, and looking round, saw that something unusual had taken place. He pointed to the truss of hay and said, What are those two curious things sticking out of the hay? And soon made an end of him. He thus learnt that nothing escapes the master's eye. The fox and the grapes one hot summer's day a fox was strolling through an orchard till he came to a bunch of grapes just ripening on a vine which had been trained over a lofty branch. Just the thing to quench my thirst. Drawing back a few paces, he took a run and a jump, and just missed the bunch. Turning round again with a one, two, three, he jumped up, but with no greater success. Again and again he tried after the tempting morsel, but at last had to give it up, and walked away with his nose in the air, saying, I am sure they are sour. The peacock and Juno a peacock once placed a petition before Juno desiring to have the voice of a nightingale in addition to his other attractions. But Juno refused his request, when he persisted, and pointed out that he was her favorite bird. She said, Be content with your lot. Hunter and stag a quarrel had arisen between the horse and the stag. So the horse came to a hunter to ask his help to take revenge on the stag. The hunter agreed, but said, If you desire to conquer the stag, and the hunter soon saddled and bridled him. Then with the aid of the hunter the horse soon overcame the stag, and said to the hunter, Now get off, and remove those things from my mouth and back. I have now got you under bit and spur, and prefer to keep you as you are at present. They will use you for theirs. The fox and the lion, when first the fox saw the lion, he was terribly frightened, and ran away and hid himself in the wood. Next time, however, he came near the king of beasts, he stopped at a safe distance and watched him pass by. The third time they came near one another, the fox went straight up to the lion and passed the time of day with him, asking him how his family were, and when he should have the pleasure of seeing him again. Then, turning his tail, he parted from the lion without much ceremony. Familiarity breeds contempt. The lion and the statue a man and a lion were discussing the relative strength of men and lions in general. The man contended that he and his fellows were stronger than lions by reason of their greater intelligence. Come now with me. But proves nothing, for it was a man who made the statue. The ant and the grasshopper in a field one summer's day a grasshopper was hopping about, chirping and singing to its heart's content, and it passed by, bearing along with great toil an ear of corn he was taking to the nest. Why not come and chat with me? Instead of toiling and moiling in that way, I am helping to lay up food for the winter, and recommend you to do the same. Why bother about winter? We have got plenty of food at present. When the winter came, the grasshopper had no food and found itself dying of hunger, while it saw the ants distributing every day corn and grain from the stores they had collected in the summer. Then the grasshopper knew it is best to prepare for the days of necessity. The tree, the reed, well, little one, said a tree to a reed that was growing at its foot. Why do you not plant your feet deeply in the ground, and raise your head boldly in the air as I do? I am contented with my lot. I may not be so grand, but I think I am safer safe. 
for a hurricane arose which tore it up from its roots and cast it a useless log on the ground while the little reed bending to the force of the wind soon stood upright again when the storm had passed over obscurity often brings safety the fox and the cat of fox was boasting to a cat of its clever devices for escaping its enemies which contains a hundred ways of escaping my enemies i have only one and the cat immediately scampered up a tree and hid herself in the boughs what are you going to do then of another and while he was debating the hounds came nearer and nearer and at last the fox in his confusion was caught up by the hounds and soon killed by the huntsman miss puss who had been looking on said better one safe way than a hundred on which you cannot reckon but one day it found the skin of a sheep so it put it on over its own pelt and strolled down among the sheep the lamb that belonged to the sheep whose skin the wolf was wearing began to follow the wolf in the sheep's clothing so leading the lamb a little apart he soon made a meal off her and for some time he succeeded in deceiving the sheep and enjoying hearty meals appearances are deceptive the dog in the manger a dog looking out for its afternoon nap jumped into the manger of an ox and lay there cosily upon the straw but soon the ox returning from its afternoon work came up to the manger and wanted to eat some of the straw the dog in a rage being awakened from its slumber stood up and barked at the ox and whenever it came near attempted to bite it at last the ox had to give up the hope of getting at the straw and went away muttering ah people often grudge others what they cannot enjoy themselves and prayed to them to give them luck it happened that a man had often prayed to a wooden idol he had received from his father but his luck never seemed to change he prayed and he prayed but still he remained as unlucky as ever one day in the greatest rage he went to the wooden god and with one blow swept it down from its pedestal the idol broke in two and what did he see an immense number of coins flying all over the place the fisher a fisher once took his bagpipes to the bank of a river and played upon them with the hope of making the fish rise but never a one put his nose out of the water so he cast his net into the river and soon drew it forth filled with fish then he took his bagpipes again and as he played the fish leapt up in the net ah you dance now when i play yes it was rather lonely for him all day so he thought upon a plan by which he could get a little company and some excitement he rushed down towards the village calling out wolf wolf and the villagers came out to meet him and some of them stopped with him for a considerable time this pleased the boy so much that a few days afterwards he tried the same trick and again the villagers came to his help but shortly after this a wolf actually did come out from the forest and began to worry the sheep and the boy of course cried out wolf wolf but this time the villagers who had been fooled twice before thought the boy was again deceiving them and nobody stirred to come to his help so the wolf made a good meal off the boy's flock and when the boy complained the wise man of the village said a liar will not be believed even when he speaks the truth he expressed his desire to see his mother and to speak with her before he was led to execution and of course this was granted when his mother came to him he said i want to whisper to you he nearly bit it off all the bystanders were horrified and asked him what he could mean by such brutal and inhuman conduct it is to punish her when i was young i began with stealing little things and brought them home to mother instead of rebuking and punishing me she laughed and said it will not be noticed the lord hath said train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart therefrom when men were allowed to have many wives a middle-aged man had one wife that was old and one that was young each loved him very much and desired to see him like herself now the man's hair was turning gray 
which the young wife did not like, as it made him look too old for her husband. So every night she used to comb his hair and pick out the white ones. But the elder wife saw her husband growing gray with great pleasure, for she did not like to be mistaken for his mother. So every morning she used to arrange his hair and pick out as many of the black ones as she could. The consequence was the man soon found himself entirely bald. Yield to all, and you will soon have nothing to yield. The nurse and the wolf be quiet now, said an old nurse to a child sitting on her lap. If you make that noise again, I will throw you to the wolf. So he crouched down by the side of the house and waited. I, in good luck today, it is sure to cry soon, and a daintier morsel I haven't had for many a long day. And he waited, and he waited, till at last the child began to cry, and the wolf came forward before the window, and looked up to the nurse, wagging his tail. But all the nurse did was to shut down the window, and call for help, and the dogs of the house came rushing out. Ah! enemy's promises were made to be broken. So he asked an eagle to carry him to his new home, promising her a rich reward for her trouble. The eagle agreed and seizing the tortoise by the shell with her talons soared aloft. On their way they met a crow, who said to the eagle, The tortoise is good eating, the shell is too hard. And the eagle, taking the hint, let fall the tortoise on a sharp rock and the two birds made a hearty meal of the tortoise. Never soar aloft on an enemy's pinions. The two crabs one fine day, two crabs came out from their home to take a stroll on the sand. Child, you should accustom yourself to walking straight forward without twisting from side to side. Pray, mother, do but set the example yourself. The ass in the lion's skin and as once, found a lion's skin which the hunters had left out in the sun to dry. He put it on and went towards his native village. All fled at his approach, both men and animals, and he was a proud ass that day. In his delight he lifted up his voice and brayed, but then every one knew him, and his owner came up and gave him a sound, cudgelling for the fright he had caused. And shortly afterwards a fox came up to him and said, I, I knew you by your voice, but silly words will disclose a fool. The two fellows and the bear two fellows were traveling together through a wood, when a bear rushed out upon them. One of the travelers happened to be in front, and he seized hold of the branch of a tree, and hid himself among the leaves. The other, seeing no help for it, threw himself flat down upon the ground, with his face in the dust. The bear, coming up to him, put his muzzle close to his ear, and sniffed and sniffed, but at last, with a growl, he shook his head and slouched off, for bears will not touch dead meat. Then the fellow in the tree came down to his comrade, and, laughing, said, What was it that Master Bruin whispered to you? He told me, said the other, one of brass, and one of earthenware. When the tide rose, they both floated off down the stream. Now the earthenware pot tried its best to keep aloof from the brass one, which cried out, I fear nothing, friend, I will not strike you, but I may come in contact with you. If I come too close, and whether I hit you or you hit me, I shall suffer for it. The four oxen and the lion a lion used to prowl about a field in which four oxen used to dwell. Many a time he tried to attack them, but whenever he came near they turned their tails to one another, so that whichever way he approached them he was met by the horns of one of them. At last, however, they fell a-quarrelling among themselves, and each went off to pasture alone in a separate corner of the field. Then the lion attacked them one by one, and soon made an end of all four. United we stand, divided we fall. The fisher and the little fish it happened that a fisher, after fishing all day, caught only a little fish. Pray let me go, master. I am much too small for your eating just now. If you put me back into the river I shall soon grow. 
I have you now, I may not catch you hereafter. Avaricious and envious two neighbors came before Jupiter, and prayed him to grant their heart's desire. Now the one was full of avarice, and the other eaten up with envy. So to punish them both, Jupiter granted that each might have whatever he wished for himself, but only on condition that his neighbor had twice as much. The avaricious man prayed to have a room full of gold. No sooner said than done. But all his joy was turned to grief when he found that his neighbor had two rooms full of the precious metal. Then came the turn of the envious man, who could not bear to think that his neighbor had any joy at all. So he prayed that he might have one of his own eyes put out, by which means his companion would become totally blind. Vices are their own punishment. The crow and the pitcher a crow, half dead with thirst, came upon a pitcher which had once been full of water. But when the crow put its beak into the mouth of the pitcher, he found that only very little water was left in it, and that he could not reach far enough down to get at it. He tried, and he tried but at last had to give up in despair. Then a thought came to him, and he took a pebble and dropped it into the pitcher. Then he took another pebble and dropped it into the pitcher. Then he took another pebble and dropped that into the pitcher. Then he took another pebble and dropped that into the pitcher. Then he took another pebble and dropped that into the pitcher. Then he took another pebble and dropped that into the pitcher. At last, at last, he saw the water mount up near him, and after casting in a few more pebbles, he was able to quench his thirst and save his life. Little by little does the trick. The man and the sitter a man had lost his way in a wood one bitter winter's night, as he was roaming about. A sitter came up to him, and finding that he had lost his way, promised to give him a lodging for the night, and guide him out of the forest in the morning. As he went along to the sitter's cell, the man raised both his hands to his mouth and kept on blowing at them. What do you do that for? After this, they arrived at the sitter's home, and soon the sitter put a smoking dish of porridge before him. But when the man raised his spoon to his mouth, he began blowing upon it. The porridge is too hot. When he took it up, it was as heavy as lead, and he was going to throw it away, because he thought a trick had been played upon him. But he took it home on second thoughts, and soon found to his delight that it was an egg of pure gold. Every morning the same thing occurred, and he soon became rich by selling his eggs. As he grew rich he grew greedy, and thinking to get at once all the gold the goose could give, he killed it and opened it only to find nothing. Read oft or reaches itself. The laborer and the nightingale, a laborer lay listening to a nightingale's song throughout the summer night. So pleased was he with it that the next night he set a trap for it and captured it. Now that I have caught thee, thou shalt always sing to me. We nightingales never sing in a cage. But let me free, and I'll tell thee three things far better worth than my poor body and he flew up to a branch of a tree and said, The fox, the cock, and the dog one moonlight night a fox was prowling about a farmer's hen coop, and saw a cock roosting high up beyond his reach. Good news, good news. Why, what is that? King Lion has declared a universal truce. No beast may hurt a bird henceforth. And there I see someone coming, with whom we can share the good tidings. What is it you see? It is only my master's dog that is coming towards us what going so soon. As the fox began to turn away, as soon as he had heard the news, will you not stop and congratulate the dog on the reign of universal peace? I would gladly do so. The wind and the sun, the wind and the sun were disputing which was the stronger. Suddenly they saw a traveler coming down the road, and the sun said, I see a way to decide our dispute. Whichever of us can cause that traveler to take off his cloak shall be regarded as the stronger. And the wind began to blow as hard as it could upon the traveler. But the harder he blew, the more closely did the traveler wrap his cloak round him. 
till at last the wind had to give up in despair. Then the sun came out and shone in all his glory upon the traveller, who soon found it too hot to walk with his cloak on. Kindness effects more than severity. Hercules and the wagoner a wagoner was once driving a heavy load along a very muddy way. At last he came to a part of the road where the wheels sank halfway into the mire, and the more the horses pulled, the deeper sank the wheels. So the wagoner threw down his whip, and knelt down and prayed to Hercules the strong. O oh, Hercules, help me in this my hour of distress. But Hercules appeared to him, and said, Tut, man, don't sprawl there. The gods help them that help themselves. The miser and his gold once, upon a time there was a miser, who used to hide his gold at the foot of a tree in his garden. But every week he used to go and dig it up and gloat over his gains. A robber, who had noticed this, went and dug up the gold and decamped with it. When the miser next came to gloat over his treasures, he found nothing but the empty hole. He tore his hair and raised such an outcry that all the neighbors came around him, and he told them how he used to come and visit his gold. Did you ever take any of it out? I only came to look at it. Then come again and look at the hole. It will do you just as much good. The man, the boy, and the donkey, a man and his son, were once going with their donkey to market. As they were walking along by its side, a countryman passed them and said, You fools! What is a donkey for but to ride upon? But soon they passed a group of men, one of whom said, He lets his father walk while he rides, and got on himself. But they hadn't gone far when they passed two women, one of whom said to the other, Well, the man didn't know what to do, but at last he took his boy up before him on the donkey. By this time they had come to the town, and the passers-by began to jeer and point at them. The man stopped and asked what they were scoffing at. The men said, The man and boy got off and tried to think what to do. They thought and they thought till at last they cut down a pole, tied the donkey's feet to it, and raised the pole and the donkey to their shoulders. They went along amid the laughter of all who met them till they came to Market Bridge, when the donkey, getting one of his feet loose, kicked out and caused the boy to drop his end of the pole. In the struggle the donkey fell over the bridge, and his four feet being tied together he was drowned. It please all, and you will please none, and could not move. A number of mosquitoes, seeing its plight, settled upon it, and enjoyed a good meal undisturbed by its tail. A hedgehog, strolling by, took pity upon the fox, and went up to him. You are in a bad way, neighbor. Shall I relieve you by driving off those mosquitoes, who are sucking your blood? Thank you, Master Hedgehog. But I would rather not. Why, how is that? Well, you see. These mosquitoes have had their fill. If you drive these away, others will come with fresh appetite and bleed me to death. And in struggling to release himself, lost all of it but the stump. At first, he was ashamed to show himself among his fellow foxes. But at last, he determined to put a bolder face upon his misfortune, and summoned all the foxes to a general meeting to consider a proposal which he had to place before them. When they had assembled together, the fox proposed that they should all do away with their tails. He pointed out how inconvenient a tail was when they were pursued by their enemies, the dogs, how much it was in the way when they desired to sit down and hold a friendly conversation with one another. He failed to see any advantage in carrying about such a useless encumbrance. The one eyed Doodo had had the misfortune to lose one of her eyes and could not see any one approaching her on that side. So to avoid any danger she always used to feed on a high cliff near the sea, with her sound eye looking towards the land. By this means she could see whenever the hunters approached her on land, and often escaped by this means. But the hunters found out that she was blind of one eye, and hiring a boat rowed under the cliff where she used to feed, and shot her from the sea. Ah. 
you cannot escape your fate. The mice had a general council to consider what measures they could take to outwit their common enemy, the cat. Some said this, and some said that, but at last a young mouse got up, which he thought would meet the case. You will all agree. Now, if we could receive some signal of her approach, we could easily escape from her. I venture, therefore, to propose that a small bell be procured, and attached by a ribbon round the neck of the cat. By this means we should always know when she was about, and could easily retire while she was in the neighborhood. Until an old mouse got up and said, That is all very well, but who is to bell the cat? Then the old mouse said, It is easy to propose impossible remedies. I have never yet been beaten. When I put forth my full speed, I challenge any one here to race with me. I accept your challenge. That is a good joke. I keep your boasting till you've beaten. Shall we race? The hare darted almost out of sight at once, but soon stopped and, to show his contempt for the tortoise, lay down to have a nap. The tortoise plodded on and plodded on, and when the hare awoke from his nap, he saw the tortoise just near the winning post and could not run up in time to save the race. Then said the tortoise, Plodding wins the race, bent double with age and toil was gathering sticks in a forest. At last he grew so tired and hopeless that he threw down the bundle of sticks, and cried out, I cannot bear this life any longer. I wish death would only come and take me. Death, a grisly skeleton, appeared and said to him, What waltzed though mortal? I heard thee call me, please, sir. Would you kindly help me to lift this faggot of sticks onto my shoulder? A hare with many friends, a hare was very popular with the other beasts, who all claimed to be her friends. But one day she heard the hounds approaching and hoped to escape them by the aid of her many friends. So she went to the horse and asked him to carry her away from the hounds on his back, but he declined, stating that he had important work to do for his master. He felt sure and hoped that he would repel the hounds with his horns. The bull replied, I am very sorry, but I have an appointment with a lady, but I feel sure that our friend the goat will do what you want. However, feared that his back might do her some harm if he took her upon it. The ram, he felt sure, was the proper friend to apply to. So she went to the ram and told him the case. The ram replied, Another time, my dear friend, I do not like to interfere on the present occasion, as hounds have been known to eat sheep as well as hares, as a last hope to the calf, who regretted that he was unable to help her, as he did not like to take the responsibility upon himself, as so many older persons than himself had declined the task. By this time the hounds were quite near, and the hare took to her heels and luckily escaped. He that has many friends, has no friends. The lion in love a lion once fell in love with a beautiful maiden and proposed marriage to her parents. The old people did not know what to say. They did not like to give their daughter to the lion. Yet they did not wish to enrage the king of beasts. At last the father said, We feel highly honored by your majesty's proposal. But when he came again to the parents of the young girl, they simply laughed in his face, and bade him do his worst. Love contained the wildest. The bundle of sticks an old man on the point of death summoned his sons around him to give them some parting advice. He ordered his servants to bring in a faggot of sticks, and said to his eldest son, Break it, but with all his efforts was unable to break the bundle. The other sons also tried, but none of them was successful untie the faggots. He called out to them, Now break. You see my meaning. Union gives strength. The lion, the fox, and the beasts the lion once gave out, that he was sick unto death, and summoned the animals to come and hear his last will and testament. So the goat came to the lion's cave, 
and stopped there listening for a long time. Then a sheep went in, and before she came out a calf came up to receive the last wishes of the Lord of the Beasts. But soon the lion seemed to recover, and came to the mouth of his cave, and saw the fox, who had been waiting outside for some time. Why do you not come to pay your respects to me? I beg your majesty's pardon. The ass's brains the lion and the fox went hunting together. The lion, on the advice of the fox, sent a message to the ass, proposing to make an alliance between their two families. The ass came to the place of meeting, overjoyed at the prospect of a royal alliance. But when he came there the lion simply pounced on the ass and said to the fox, Here is our dinner, for today watch you here while I go and have a nap. But finding that his master did not return, ventured to take out the brains of the ass and ate them up. When the lion came back he soon noticed the absence of the brains and asked the fox in a terrible voice, Your Majesty, it had none, or it would never have fallen into your trap. The eagle and the arrow an eagle was soaring through the air when suddenly it heard the whiz of an arrow, and felt itself wounded to death. Slowly it fluttered down to the earth, with its life blood pouring out of it. Looking down upon the arrow with which it had been pierced, it found that the shaft of the arrow had been feathered with one of its own plumes. As it died, we often give our enemies the means for our own destruction. Jupiter said yes, but Venus said no so. To try the question, Jupiter turned a cat into a maiden and gave her to a young man for a wife. The wedding was duly performed, and the young couple sat down to the wedding feast. To Venus, how beckomingly she behaves! Who could tell that yesterday she was but a cat? Surely her nature is changed, and let loose a mouse into the room. No sooner did the bride see this than she jumped up from her seat and tried to pounce upon the mouse. Ah, you see. As she went along she began calculating what she would do with the money she would get for the milk. I'll buy some falls from Farmer Brown, which I will sell to the parson's wife. With the money that I get from the sale of these eggs I'll buy myself a new dimity frock and a chip hat. And when I go to market, won't all the young men come up and speak to me? Polly Shaw will be that jealous. But I don't care. I shall just look at her and toss my head like this. As she spoke, she tossed her head back. The pail fell off it, and all the milk was spilt. So she had to go home and tell her mother what had occurred. Ah, my child, do not count your chickens before they are hatched. The horse prancing along in its fine trappings. The yes, ass carrying with difficulty the heavy weight in its panniers. I wish I were you. Nothing to do and well fed, and all that fine harness upon you. However, there was a great battle, and the horse was wounded to death in the final charge of the day. His friend, the ass, happened to pass by shortly afterwards and found him on the point of death. I was wrong. They were about to proceed to put him to death when he begged them to hear his plea for mercy. I do not fight, and indeed carry no weapon. I only blow this trumpet, and surely that cannot harm you. Then why should you kill me? You may not fight yourself. The buffoon and the countryman at a country fair, there was a buffoon who made all the people laugh by imitating the cries of various animals. He finished off by squeaking so like a pig that the spectators thought that he had a porker concealed about him. But a countryman, who stood by, said, All oh, that a pig's squeak, nothing like it. You give me till tomorrow, and I will show you what it's like. But next day, sure enough, the countryman appeared on the stage, and putting his head down squealed so hideously that the spectators hissed and threw stones at him to make him stop. You fools! You see what you have been hissing. Men often applaud an imitation and hiss the real thing. The old woman and the wine jar you must know that sometimes old women like a glass of wine. One of this sort once found a wine jar lying in the road, and eagerly went up to it hoping to find it full. 
but when she took it up she found that all the wine had been drunk out of it. Still she took a long sniff at the mouth of the jar. Ah! What memories cling round the instruments of our pleasure! A goat passed by shortly afterwards, and asked the fox what he was doing down there. Oh, have you not heard? There is going to be a great drought, so I jumped down here in order to be sure to have water by me. Why don't you come down too? And jumped down into the well. But the fox immediately jumped on her back, and by putting his foot on her long horns managed to jump up to the edge of the well. Goodbye, friend. Remember next time. Hoorah.